Hi, and welcome to another Bruja video. In this video, we're going to be demonstrating how to make fantastic beer using the Bruja Biak brewing system. We'll be making 118 liters or 31 gallons of beer. However, the recipe can be easily scaled up or down to any of the sizes that we sell using a program such as Brewfather. The Bruja Biak is the simplest way to brew the best beer. It is the simplest to set up, it is the simplest to operate, and it is the simplest to clean, all the while taking up the smallest footprint of any commercial system and using the least amount of water, while still providing full control over the brewing process so that you can make the best tasting beer exactly how you want it. And it is the only brewing system in the world that uses heat to sanitize rather than toxic cleaning chemicals. All of this has been achieved by reducing the brew house, what in a traditional brewery is a large platform with multiple fixed vessels and lots of piping and pumps, to just one vessel, the mash colander. One mash colander can be used as as many different brew hop fermenters as the customer wants to meet the production needs of their brewery, be it one, two, four, six, or 10 fermenters, you name it. Let's get to the brew. Today we will be brewing an amber ale. The recipe and brew sheet showing key numbers we will be following can be found along with several other recipes on the Bruja website. We are using metric units today, but in Brewfather units can be changed however one prefers. And for easy reference, we will be following the general structure for brewing that is laid out in the brewing section of the Bruja manual. To search for either, just enter the search word Amber Ale Recipe or Bruja Manual on the Bruja website. After brewing a few times, making your own recipes is not difficult. Brewing software programs such as we mentioned Brewfather, or there's also Beersmith, can help you calculate exactly what is needed, as well as help build recipes for given styles of beer. There are 12 steps to brewing beer in the Bruja Biak that we discuss here. Step one, heating water. This takes about 30 to 60 minutes, depending on the volume and the size that you're using. Water for soaking the grain, which is called the strike water or the mash water, is added to the fermenter. Tap water can be used if it's good quality. As a general rule, if the tap water tastes good, it can be used for brewing. However, if it contains a lot of minerals, metals, or chlorine, anything that might contribute off flavor, reverse osmosis or RO water should be used. Softened water should not be used as it contributes too much sodium. Some minerals, especially calcium, are necessary, so RO water needs to have brewing mineral salts added back in. Calcium chloride, Epsom or magnesium sulfate, chalk and gypsum, calcium sulfate are the main ones. Baking soda like sodium bicarbonate and non-iodized table salt, like sodium chloride, are also used. Brewing software such as Brewfather can calculate these additions. More advanced brewers will want to learn more about water chemistry as it can have a significant impact on the beer. Local municipalities normally make their water analysis reports available and data from these can be entered into brewing software such as Brewfather and a local water profile created. From this, the program can make suggestions for brewing salt additions based on the style of beer and or the target water profile. Water volume or the strike volume can be calculated based on the full boil volume. While each recipe will differ, this volume is approximately one and a quarter to one and three quarter times the final amount of beer that you're making. So for a 118 liter or a one barrel batch of beer, the initial volume will be approximately 148 to 200 liters. Grain absorbs approximately its own weight in water, about 10% of final volume is boiled off, and five to 10% is absorbed by hops and yeast. So if you want 118 liters or 31 gallons or one barrel of beer, and start with 20 kilograms or 44 pounds of grain, you need to start with approximately 160 liters or 43 gallons of water. If one wants to rinse the grain, which is called sparging, as the sugar water or the wort drains from the mash colander at the end of the mash period, a portion of the total water can be withheld and added as rinse or sparge water as the colander is being lifted out of the fermenter. While this step is not absolutely necessary, it can increase the recovery of sugar from the grain by a small amount. As a general guideline, the sparge volume is about 10 to 20% of the full boil volume. So for example, with the 118 liter or one barrel batch, about 15 to 20 liters or four to five gallons could be withheld to sparge with. The water is heated to approximately five to eight degrees Celsius or 10 to 15 Fahrenheit above the mash temperature. And this is called the strike temperature. 
Normally it's about 73 Celsius or 163 Fahrenheit for ales. And it is higher than the mash temperature because as grain is added, it will cool the water to a typical mash temperature of around 65 Celsius or 150 degrees Fahrenheit. A few degrees cooler than that will make a drier beer and a few degrees warmer will make a sweeter beer. Step two is mashing, which is about 60 to 90 minutes. Once the water is at your strike temperature, the mash colander is lowered, if not already in place, into the water in the fermenter. The temperature on the controller is then adjusted to your mash temperature and crushed grain is added using the following steps. One, have a proper sized crush. A consistent crush of one to 1.2 millimeters gives great grain bed fluidity, which means water can easily move through it and great mash efficiency. Two, add the base malts in first. They don't tend to pulverize, whereas many specialty malts are roasted or toasted longer, which leads to further crystallization, and when crushed, they turn into powder more. Mixing in rice hulls can also improve grain bed fluidity. Three, sprinkle the malts in, don't dump them in. Add them in in such a way that they settle into the water without clumping. This reduces the need for mixing. Four, if there's floating or clumping, use the mixer only in the top two thirds of the colander. After this, it is not required to mix again, but a brief gentle stir of the top two thirds of your mash at the one third and two third point of your mash period, so for example, after 20 and after 40 minutes, can improve mash efficiency by ensuring water is not channeling down through the grain bed. Ensure the pump is off whenever manually mixing or adding the grain to minimize grain being drawn out of the bottom of the colander where it could scorch on the heaters or plug the pump. Five, let the grain sit for 10 to 15 minutes before starting the pump. It lets the grain fully absorb the water. Six, manually remove the grain that's settled to the bottom of the fermenter, i.e. out the bottom port, and then connect the pump hose. This ensures that water is unrestricted into the hose before operating the pump. Seven, open the pump discharge valve slowly and follow the flow circulation rate in table D in the manual. Eight, for added safety, turn the elements off anytime you're adding or mixing malt. Nine, during the mash, keep the heater output as low as possible to reduce the risk of scorching. Uh, for example, a 10 to 20% output on the heater is typically all that is needed to maintain mash temperature. Confirm your pH and adjust to 5.1 to 5.3 if necessary. This ensures that the brewing enzymes are happiest and you get greatest conversion. There are several ways to adjust pH but one is to add a small amount of sodium bicarbonate or baking soda to raise the pH if it's too low, or a small amount of calcium sulfate or gypsum or acids such as lactic or phosphoric acid if the pH is too high. Give the water time to adjust before remeasuring and let the mashing begin. Mashing is the process whereby proteins and enzymes in the grain are activated to process complex sugars. They take the starches and they cut them up and make them accessible for yeast to digest. For more information on mashing, you can search for mash on the Bruja website. During the mash, recirculating the sugar water or the wort with the pump can yield a higher mash efficiency, which means recovering more sugar from the grain. And circulation can also help regulate the temperature of the wort as it cycles out of the mash colander and passes the temperature sensor. If the pump is running during the mash, care needs to be taken not to circulate the water or wort too fast. If the wort level in the mash colander rises, the flow of wort from the pump should be slowed. And if the wort level rises but does not drop when the pump flow is slowed, there might be a stuck mash, which means that the grain is preventing water from passing down through the grain bed. And this might require stopping the pump and stirring to reduce grain compaction. Increasing the size of the grain crush and using rice hulls are two of the best ways to avoid a stuck mash. And as mentioned earlier, a crush size of one to 1.2 millimeters or 0.04 to 0.048 inches is recommended. Additional tips for preventing a stuck mash can be found by searching for stuck mash on the Bruja website. Wort flow will need to be throttled either by closing a valve that's on top of the pump or in the mash colander in order to ensure that the grain bed does not compact and that the element does not become exposed. The flow rate will depend on the fluidity of your grain bed, which is primarily a factor of your crush size, a crush size 
that is small produces more fines that plug up the bed and slow the flow rate. When recirculating, measure the temperature of the grain bed and the wort entering the colander to confirm that it is at target temperature. A simple pen thermometer works great for that. If it isn't, the temperature of the wort around the heating elements may need to be raised a few degrees above the target mash temperature. This is particularly true with the small biak as the low recirculation rate allows time for the wort to cool down while it's in the hose being brought up to the top. Step three, Vorloff, which is about 10 to 20 minutes. If water or wort wasn't recirculated during the mash, and in this video we are, it should be done at the end of the mash period. The grain inside the mash colander forms a filter that captures small grain particles as wort passes down through the grain bed in a process called Vorloff. Minimizing the amount of grain in your boil improves the beer's flavor. Flow rates should be close to that listed in table D of this section in the manual to help avoid the risk of a stuck mash and damage to the element. Wort should be recirculated until it clears up. Step four, lottering and heat up. This takes about 30 to 60 minutes. When mashing is complete, the mash colander is lifted out. Using the overhead hoist is desirable as it is possible to raise the colander slowly to allow for more gradual separation of grain and wort. The wort drains from the grain out through the false bottom of the mash colander in a process called lottering. Sparge water can be added to rinse the grain and increase boil volume. Fresh water for sparging can be added as the wort level drops, maintaining a two centimeter or one inch layer of water on top of the grain bed. It is generally recommended that sparge water be 75 degrees Celsius or 167 Fahrenheit to increase the fluidity of the grain and wash out the sugars more readily. However, cooler water can be used. Sparge water can be preheated in a separate hot liquor tank like the uh, Bruja hot liquor tank or sparge water can be heated by passing it through the fermenter jacket. The Bruja flow meter can be attached to the jacket if you're adding sparge water that way and used to measure the sparge water. For more information on sparging, you can search for it on the Bruja website. Once grain is removed from the wort, the heating element is gradually turned up to 100 degrees Celsius to heat the wort up to boiling. For brewers using a tabletop power controller, during the boil, the contactor whip can be unplugged from the ETC and plugged directly into a live receptacle as a wall socket and the power to the element controlled completely by the power output knob on the tabletop controller. Obviously the ETC isn't needed to regulate the temperature anymore during boil and so just using the knob is all that you need for controlling power output. For brewers using 120 volt power to protect the ETC from overheating, plug the element directly into a wall socket during the boil. Emptying your jacket before boiling is also recommended to reduce heat loss to the air. Step five, boiling. This is generally done in about 60 to 90 minutes. Once a rolling boil is achieved, the element power output, which can be adjusted zero to 100%, can be adjusted to influence the rate of evaporation and control the final volume for fermentation. If you wanna get rid of a lot of water, you'll keep it at 100%. If you don't wanna get rid of as much water, you'll have a lower percent output. Ensure steam can escape as the steam carries away some compounds that would otherwise produce off flavors in the beer. It is a good idea to closely monitor the start of boil and turn the power down or off if necessary to prevent a boil over. And this is especially important in the first few minutes of the boil until the foam or the hot break subsides. If using a steam condenser, an anti-foam agent such as the vegetable oil based Patco 376 should be added to prevent foaming. Boiling improves the flavor and kills microbes. Hops can be added into the hop basket or hop spider once the foam subsides. Early addition or boil hops provide bitterness to balance beer sweetness and late addition or aroma hops or hop stand hops provide flavor and aroma. An additive such as Irish moss or carrageenan or a commercial flocculant such as whirlflock, which is added to the last five to 10 minutes of the boil can help remove proteins and yield clear beer. Used alongside proper mashing technique, a high flocculent yeast, which is one that easily clumps and settles to the bottom of the fermenter where it can be removed, and healthy fermentation will result in clearer beer. For the last 10 minutes of the boil, the lid, with all valves removed and the lid ports left open, can be set in place to let steam sanitize the lid. Don't clamp the lid on as steam needs to escape, and the pressure relief valve should be tested regularly and always installed on the lid. 
During this period, the element power should be turned down, for example, to 40 to 70%, to reduce the risk of boiling over. The process should be monitored during this entire period to ensure boiling over does not occur, as the wort will foam more readily when the lid is in place. If not heat sanitized, either with steam or in boiling water, the lid fittings should be sanitized with chemicals. If completing a 30 to 45 minute hop stand to add hop aroma and flavor into the beer with minimal bitterness, once the heaters are turned off, the empty jacket should be filled with cold tap water to cool the wort to about 75 Celsius or 170 Fahrenheit, and the wort given a quick stir with a sterile mixer to equilibrate the temperature throughout the fermenter before adding the hops in. Step six, cooling. This takes about 30 to 120 minutes, depending on the chilling water temperature, the fermenter size, and the flow rate. Once boiling is complete, a chilling liquid, for example, cold tap water, is sent through the fermenter jacket. It is important to keep the pressure of the chilling media in the jacket below five PSI or seven PSI in the four and one fermenters, or the vessel could be damaged. No restrictions should be placed on the outflow of the jacket, and the exit and drain hose should be larger than the inlet hose, otherwise pressure could build up in the jacket. Care should be taken that no restriction can impede flow and damage the fermenter, for example, a hose kinking or valve accidentally closing. When using tap water in the jacket for chilling, a water pressure regulator should be installed before the jacket to help ensure pressure does not build up in the jacket. The lid should be installed to keep out airborne contaminants, but a port should be kept open to air during the cooling period as a vacuum could form as the water cools and the wort contracts, damaging the fermenter. Alternatively, a few PSI of carbon dioxide can be added and maintained into the fermenter to counteract any loss of pressure as the wort cools and contracts. A pressure and vacuum relief should be installed on the lid at all times to help protect the inside of the vessel and inspect the valve frequently to ensure it is operating correctly. Don't slow the flow rate of the chilling media too much as a good flow rate is necessary for faster chilling. The greater the temperature difference between the water leaving the jacket and the wort, the faster the chilling rate will be. To protect the fermenter, always use the water pressure regulator when cooling with tap water. And if tap water is not at least 10 degrees Celsius or 20 degrees Fahrenheit below your yeast pitching temperature, it should be used for the majority of cooling, for example, down to 30 Celsius or 90 Fahrenheit. And for a small, medium, or large system, the water chiller can then be used to chill the rest of the way. Never use the chiller for cooling wort that is over 30 Celsius or 90 Fahrenheit as it could damage the chiller. For the barrel and a half to a seven barrel systems, however, due to their much greater volume, the Bruja cold water or liquor tank should be used before connecting the fermenter to the chiller. For example, if you want to pitch yeast at 20 Celsius or 70 and your tap water is only at 20 Celsius or 70 Fahrenheit, First, run tap water through the fermenter jacket to bring the wort from boiling down to around 30, and then connect the cold water tank, which was chilled overnight, to bring the wort the rest of the way down to 20 or 70. And finally, connect the water chiller for any final small adjustments and to maintain fermentation temperature. When the wort is cooled and ready to have yeast pitched, a sample gravity reading is taken uh, to measure the amount of sugar at the start of fermentation. Though not necessary, for the larger systems, for example, the five and the seven barrel, in addition to using the jacket for chilling, to reduce chill time, some customers will use a separate plate chiller to increase surface area and will run a closed loop of hot wort out from the fermenter through the plate chiller and back into the fermenter. This is used in addition to the uh, using the jacket for chilling. Passing the boiling wort through the lines, the pump and the plate chiller for the last several minutes of boil will sanitize them. And for best results, always thoroughly clean the chiller immediately after each use. Step seven, filtering and resting wort and pitching yeast. This takes about 10 minutes. When the wort reaches yeast pitching temperature, the protein that has settled to the bottom is removed out the bottom port. Generally, this is about two to 5% of the total volume. To facilitate healthy yeast at the start of fermentation, oxygen or filtered air is normally added to the wort through the bottom port with the wort aeration stone. 
The addition of oxygen in the bottom also helps equilibrate the temperature inside as the rising bubbles stir up the wort. The addition of oxygen can be precisely measured by gas flow meters and the amount of dissolved oxygen tested for by dissolved oxygen meters, but as a general rule, pure oxygen should be added for one to five minutes, depending on the size of your tank, and air, which is 20% oxygen, for about eight to 10 minutes. Again, for the largest tanks, it might be a bit longer. The temperature is checked again to ensure that it is correct and that it is equilibriated and that it's the proper temperature for adding yeast. And if no further chilling is necessary, the yeast is pitched, the gas blow-off hose connected to a lid port with the distant end of the hose in a bucket of water and the lid sealed. Fermentation should start within 12 to 48 hours as evidenced by bubbles appearing in the airlock or in the bucket. Or if you've been using the uh, self-carbonating method as discussed on the website, you will see pressure start to rise in the tank. Step eight, rinsing out mash colander and the pump assembly. This takes about 15 minutes. If not rinsed out during sparge by running the sparge water through the pump, the colander, the pump, and the hoses should be thoroughly rinsed out now. Step nine is fermentation. This takes typically about seven to 14 days. To maintain fermentation temperature, the temperature control valve, if using cold tap water, or the water chiller are used. Once programmed the desired fermentation temperature, the ETC will power the TCV to let uh, cooling tap water or the water chiller, the, either the compressor or the chiller pump, depending on one's preferred setup, and you can see the option in the chiller section of the manual. This will put the chilling water into the jacket whenever the fermenter rises above the set temperature. Once the fermenter is cooled back down to the set temperature, the TCV or the chiller will stop the circulation of cooling water. Most beer styles are fermented at or below room temperature, so only cooling is needed during fermentation. But if needing a warm ferment, uh, for example, for kettle sours or saisons, the fermenter can be connected to a controller. In a brewery context, additional small controllers can be purchased for heating multiple fermenters. The power output should only be kept to two to 3% during fermentation so that heaters do not scorch the yeast. If the yeast coats the heater and the heat can't escape, then you risk scorching. After fermentation has slowed down, which is typically about four to six days for ales and one to two weeks for lagers, yeast can be removed out the bottom of the fermenter through the dump port. First remove the blow-off hose from water or add a few PSI of CO2 into the top of the fermenter so that water for your blow-off tank is not sucked up into the fermenter. Removing the yeast will help ensure that yeast cake does not harden and make removal or cleaning difficult at the end. Step 10, conditioning and carbonating. This takes one to four weeks. The time it takes for conditioning, which is maturing of the flavor, depends on the style of the beer. Light, simple ales take one to two weeks. Lagers or dark, complex beers can take up to four weeks or longer. Fermentation mostly completes, that is, it uh, reaches final gravity, normally within a week or two, but it is the final cleanup work that yeast does that'll take a beer from tasting good to tasting great. By sampling the beer during fermentation, one can learn to tell when it is finished. Prior to the transfer, to help clear the beer and make transfer easier if the beer is carbonated, it is often crashed to near freezing temperature for several days. A product like Biofine can also be added at this point uh, to assist with sedimentation. By using a sight glass, a valve, and a gas in post, and by sterilizing before you connect them, you can put a bit of Biofine into the sight glass, blow some CO2 through it to purge it out, and then connect it to the racking arm and then letting beer out of the racking arm into the sight glass and blowing it back into the tank and adding additional gas can ensure that the biofine is equally distributed throughout the tank inside. For getting the temperature down, our removable neoprene insulating jackets can be installed on the regular fermenters to help the chiller get it that much colder than would be possible without the jacket. If cold crashing, be sure to add uh, some carbon dioxide pressure to offset any vacuum that forms as the beer cools and shrinks. For more information on carbonating in bottles or naturally carbonating in the 4-in-1 fermenter, search for Carbonate on the Bruja website. If carbonating in kegs, kegs can be stored in a cold room with 10 to 14 psi of gas pressure, depending on the style of beer. Carbonating occurs much faster and a lower pressure if the beer is cold. Step 11, racking or transferring to bottles or kegs. This takes 15 to 60 minutes, depending on the size of your fermenter. 
While beer can be served directly from the four-in-one fermenters, most customers will transfer to kegs to free up the fermenter for the next batch of beer. For detailed instructions on this, uh, search for clean kegs or fill kegs on the Bruja website, or you can watch the video here. Once the beer is removed from the fermenter, all that is left is cleaning the fermenter out and readying it for the next batch of beer. This takes about 10 to 15 minutes. Any yeast remaining at the bottom can be disposed and the fermenter rinsed out. A stainless safe scrubby, such as the Euro scrubber, can be used to clean off the Krausen that has dried on the side. The fermenter should be removed, ball valves disassembled and rinsed out, and the port and ferrules should be cleaned out, the heaters removed, and heating rods thoroughly cleaned off. And that's basically it. The fermenter can be reassembled and readied for the next brew. And there you have it. Full control, brilliant tasting beer, and all in less space and equipment than ever before. If you have any questions, answers can be found on the Bruja website, or you can reach us by emailing us using the form on the Bruja website. Thank you for watching.